Welcome DEF CON to the Do No Harm panel. If you're joining us for the first time, this is a panel looking at the complexities of the hacker community and healthcare. Uh, we're joined by an amazing panel of people who will introduce themselves shortly. Uh, but before I begin, I want to introduce our other um, moderator, uh, Replicant. Hey guys, Replicant or Jeff here. I'm very happy and honored to be back with you today. Um, for those of us who are joining asynchronously and watching this virtually, we hope you're doing well. Um, we're sorry to not see you in person, but understand that um, that's the best choice at this, at this time and look forward to a DEF CON where we can all get together in person, uh, happy and healthy. Um, my name is Jeff, as mentioned. Um, I'm an anesthesiologist uh, by training and I work with Quadi. I'm doing some security research on the side down here at UC San Diego man who needs no introduction but do us a favor and for those who may not be aware of the glory that is josh corman um give us a quick intro and a little bit about what you do and then all of our subsequent panelists can also say hi sure um well i'm uh josh corman i'm one of the founders of i am the cavalry uh about eight years ago august 1st and uh but very important to disclose uh right now because of some work i did on a congressional health care um task force uh, that ended in 2017. When the pandemic started, Director Krebs at the time asked me to come serve the country for a year uh, as part of the CARES Act. So I am uh, the chief strategist for uh, the pandemic response, the CISA COVID task force at CISA, the cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency. Um, so if you want to spot the Fed, guilty as charged, uh, at least for a temporary emergency hire. Uh, so um, I'm here in my official capacity. Uh, but if we touch upon things that happened before the pandemic, I, I may be wearing a different hat. Awesome. Gab, will you introduce yourself? Yes, I can do that. Um, so I am a cloud security engineer currently uh, working in healthcare, doing a lot in the insurance space and, as far, and in the regulation space as well. Um, I also do some medical device research, and my background is actually in um, genetic science and neuroscience. So kind of had that crossover. Um, I actually got into information security through medical devices. So this is a near and dear subject to me. Awesome. Stephanie? Hey, everyone. So I'm Stephanie Domas. I'm currently the Director of Strategic Security um, and Communications at Intel. And so I'm right now really focused on the critical role that hardware and firmware plays in the role of security, but more importantly to this conversation, um, as I spent the about seven years previous to that focused specifically on medical device cybersecurity. So um, did a lot of consulting with medical device manufacturers, healthcare providers, really digging into the bits of bytes of how do you design and build and maintain more secure medical devices. Wonderful. And last but not least, Jessica. Sure. I am Jessica Wilkerson. I am a senior cyber policy uh, oh God, advisor. We go back and forth between advisor and analyst uh, at the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Um, so my job is medical device cybersecurity pretty much all day, every day. Um, but from the, the government angle, so I guess I am the other fed in the room. Forgive the awkward camera angle. I am uh, technically on vacation right now. But you all were so important, I decided I had to do this panel for you. We're going to kick off the panel today with an understanding that there's a big elephant in the room, which is if this talk is about hacking healthcare and all the complexity of this, there has been a pretty serious issue going on for over a year. The elephant in the room being, of course, COVID. And we wanted to underscore that before we began, just to discuss a couple of things. One, that there's some renewed urgency in the need to address the resiliency of healthcare. You know, we've seen a lot of failures, we've been seeing them for a long time. Now with the pandemic as a backdrop, it's now more important than ever for us to really uh, address this key issue, as well as to learn more about what we failed in, what we can do better, and how us as hackers can really contribute towards this mission of improving the safety of healthcare, not just in the United States, but all the way across the world. And then so to open up the first question to the panel, we wanted to talk about uh, hackers and the amazing research that they do into medical devices and critical hospital infrastructure. You know, it seems like not a year goes by uh, where we don't see some amazing research being done, uh, hacking infusion pumps or insulin pumps, uh, attacks on HL7 and other types of 
uh, healthcare specific issues. Uh, and they tend to come out uh, into the media. And we've seen, my first question to the panel is, you know, we haven't seen a lot of that this last year, why? I'll take a stab. Um, so I, I have been involved in and witness to some uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosures uh, over the last year. Um, perhaps they're just not as public or revealed at conferences or perhaps they're happening in a more collegial behind the scenes way with a little less sensationalism. Um, but the, uh, the vulnerabilities are certainly there and the talent pool is certainly there, but maybe others also figured there was a lot on the plates of medical uh, industry at the moment and are exercising some discretion. But we'll, there's probably other reasons as well. Wonderful. So thank you, Josh, for your answer to my future question, which was that we seem to be seeing some research. It's just not very public yet. I wanted to uh, reach out to the rest of the panel, Stephanie, Jessica, Gab, you know, your thoughts on uh, what's going to happen here in the next year or so with the medical device research we really haven't been seeing over the pandemic? So I'll jump in. Um, so building on what Josh said, there there is activity happening. And so I think part of the reason you're not seeing as many uh, sort of headlines around it is because of the maturity of those coordinated vulnerability disclosure processes, which is an excellent thing. But I think the other piece of it is also around the maturity of sort of the media and knowledge in the space. So I think we're starting to reach a point where vulnerabilities being responsibly disclosed by manufacturers is business as usual. So instead of every time one of these disclosures got posted by a medical device manufacturer, instead of there being sensational headlines around it, that's becoming business as usual. So there are still vulnerabilities getting posted, they're being released by medical device manufacturers, but they're not getting picked up in those sensationalist news cycles, which I think is a, a great testament to just the maturation in the industry that it's actually a good thing that these are being disclosed and it's not worth um, sort of the scare tactics that we had seen maybe earlier on in the space. Yeah, I would really echo that. I mean, as part, oh God. Okay, good, I was, I was actually unmuted. I thought I was gonna have an, an issue, but um, <laughs> um, I would echo that from the FDA space. I mean, this is, this is my job. I do vulnerability response for medical devices. And so let me assure you, there is no shortages of medical device vulnerabilities because if they did, I would have a much easier job than I do. Um, but like Stephanie and like Josh are saying, you know, the industry has really come a long way in terms of maturity and, uh, you know, not just the industry, not just the researchers, um, the FDA has also matured of, you know, what we've seen and what we've gone through and what we've experienced. And so our response, I think, also influences the way uh, that a lot of these sometimes get reported. And, and I am actually very happy to report that in a lot of cases now, We'll get a vulnerability. We have the internal expertise within FDA to do our own analysis of patient safety risks. Um, and then, you know, we just sort of give it to the teams. We give it to the reviewers to say, you know, go forth and work with the medical device manufacturer and get this thing fixed. And, and they do it. And it's just, um, like Stephanie said, it's just business as usual. You know, from the engineering perspective, I think additionally, they're, you're just being pulled in so many directions right now. Um, I think there's different things happening across the entire industry and not just in the healthcare space. So I know that like my team and the work that I do, we have just so many different projects involving different types of technology and different things across the industry. Um, so it's been a little bit harder to try and focus on uh, the medical devices specifically. Let me just kind of pull back things a little bit in general and say that um, at the last do no harm, which was all virtual on Discord. I think we were still kind of a little bit in the acute shock period of everything that was going on with respect to the pandemic. And now we are 18 months into this. We have really seen Christian and I clinically how much of an impact it's had on how we currently practice medicine, how we're likely to do so in the future. I'm curious just to kind of set the stage for some of the questions we're getting into later. What are some of the sort of lessons or changes in perspective that you have all had as a result of being able to kind of sit with this for a little bit longer and decompress. Um, I don't, we're obviously nowhere close to being out of it, but now that we're a little bit removed from that acute crisis period, where have you sort of changed and how do you look at the space as a whole and the major pain points and problems that you're thinking about and what sort of surprised you about that entire process? I'm gonna wanna go last on this one. <laughs> 
You said you do want to go last. Um, Gab, did you have something you wanted to say? Nope, you're good. All right. Well, so I mean, I think you know it's, it's interesting for for FDA and coming at this from the healthcare federal government angle. Um, we all went on remote work, I think, in like March. But of course, healthcare you cannot work remote healthcare. Um, I think Jeff and Christian, you probably know that better than anybody. Like the patients still have to go to hospitals. People still have to see doctors. All of these things still have to to carry on. And um, healthcare is just so incredibly highly digitized that you know we we already knew that we had this reliance on um, on digital technologies. And, and Josh, I don't know what your your over dependence on you have this phrase that you use, which you can repeat uh, when when you speak. But um, you know we are we knew we were dependent, right? Like that was that wasn't a secret. I think the extent to which we were dependent and the ease with which critical functionality can be disrupted um, on accident on purpose. Um, for whatever reason, just really underscored the criticality of um, figuring out cybersecurity and healthcare to to a, a significant degree than we have right now. We, you know, we we have come incredibly far from when Josh, you set up. I'm the cavalry, Stephanie, when you were with MedSec and, and all of that. Um, but you know, we we still have an incredible way to go, and I, and I think the pandemic was a little bit humbling in that sense of of revealing um you know that we that we had a lot of this work still ahead of us yeah and at least for me just speaking about kind of the the trends i saw in the industry you know for the first half of it i would say um we were exponentially increasing our cyber risk in the healthcare space by just moving devices around pop-up clinics uh, you know standing up like beds in, in parking lots um, I mean, so the cybersecurity risk was growing exponentially, yet from a consulting point, like a consultant's perspective, I can tell you that um, there was no spare cycles for uh, tackling that risk at the time. There was a lot of technical debt taken very early on in the pandemic around cybersecurity because everyone's top functionality was just get it working, right? We just have to make it work. And so the last six months or so, I would say, is when I've started to see that technical debt um, being cashed in, you're starting to see people get their heads above water in the healthcare space and try to now, now I guess, redeem that technical debt um, and get rid of it. So uh, it's been interesting seeing that cycle of, of now people are finally coming back up for air and trying to kind of tackle the spaghetti monster that was made for very good reasons. Um, but just an interesting observation. We're not out of the woods yet. The technical debt's still there. Um, but we are starting to chisel away at it. So um, I'll try to be brief on some of these things. Um, I referred back to that. We, we had a congressional task force for healthcare industry cybersecurity as part of the CISA 2015 law. We started in 2016 and finished Mother's Day weekend 2017 when WannaCry affected 40% of the UK's healthcare delivery. So we knew a bunch of seams and cracks in the US ability to provide medical care. We knew many of them, we flagged several, some got started like the S-bomb work and other good reforms. But uh, the, the pandemic just took all those seams and cracks and, and really just overstressed and strained and sprained and broke many more. Um, so uh, we were hoping that uh, ransom crews would not, uh, would realize they too live in the world and they too would be a victim to, um, degraded and delayed patient care, but uh, instead, as we feared, there was an elevated volume and variety of deliberate disruption to healthcare delivery, nursing homes, PPEs, ventilator supply chains early in the pandemic. Um, building on some of the great things said prior, um, people did have to stand up spaghetti uh, monsters, I love that phrase, um, out of necessity to do their jobs or to, to respond to the various stages of the pandemic. Um, so they had their old attack surface and, and now a new one, often using unsupported technologies that couldn't be patched in an emergency, even if they wanted to. And worse, because a lot of the elective surgeries that are the top revenue generators for a lot of these institutions couldn't happen, um, people were laying off and furloughing IT staff and IT security staff last summer. Um, and while they did somehow claw back some of that tech debt, we know from that same task force that our estimate at the time was 85% of the hospitals in the US don't have a single cybersecurity person on staff. So we're often giving cyber hygiene advice and do implement zero trust platitudes or implement multi-factor authentication when they don't have any money. So 
the degree to which a lot of these healthcare institutions were what I now call target rich and cyber poor uh, and living below when you need their security poverty line um, really has gotten worse during the pandemic as well. So don't want to be all doom and gloom, but the effects are pretty severe. And um, some of the analysis that, you know, we had a, uh, I don't know the final count of CARES Act hires, but we hired data scientists, infectious disease specialists, uh, physicians like Dr. Ruben Pasternak that I know you two work with. Um, and with, with, through this fusion center, we started looking at what are the impacts of the pandemic and the ransoms on the, the nation's ability to provide medical care. We track 55 things called national critical functions, NCFs. Uh, these are the things that affect national security, national economic security, and national health and public safety. The one that's been in the red zone and the purple zone for the most of the pandemic is called provide medical care. And this is what two of you do professionally every day. Um, we looked at severe strains throughout the pandemic, initially noticing um, a new problem because of the pandemic, which was cascading failures. So it used to be that if you had a ransom or an outage or some power problem, you would merely divert ambulances to the next nearby facility. And that's kind of predicated on the next nearby facility being able to receive anybody. So when everyone's at a saturated level or in the red zone themselves, a failure in any single hospitals tended to have cascading stressors or failovers uh, in nearby facilities. Uh, so Christian, I heard in your amazing testimony to House Energy and Commerce, similar sentiments. So we started studying that as well. Then we started looking at something very poorly covered in the media, but the CDC tracks something really important every year, uh, every month called excess deaths. And this is the difference between expected deaths and actual deaths uh, by condition, by month, by state, and at the national level. And when the US hit that February milestone of 500,000 lost Americans to COVID, we also hit a different milestone of 150,000 lost Americans to non-COVID conditions that are otherwise treatable, very treatable. The number one age demographic of that was 25 to 44 year olds. So young folks that could have been saved, but for excessive loads on our healthcare delivery across the country. So these are things like time sensitive things like heart attacks, strokes, um, cancer, uh, where time matters, minutes matter, hours matter, days or, or weeks. So uh, Christian and others on this panel in the past, we, we often cite the New England Journal of Medicine article that says 4.4 minutes during a marathon can be the difference between life and death and increased mortality rates for heart attacks. We know with strokes, the difference between life and death could be one, three, or four hours. So what did four weeks of interruption in the state of Vermont do uh, with the UVM Medical Center and 118 facilities in upstate New York, Vermont, and New Hampshire? So again, where minutes matter, we know that delayed integrated patient care affects outcomes, including mortality rates. You know, We were deeply concerned about this and almost done some of these truth bombs, but when we looked with data scientists for the first time in this fusion center, we, we started to say, is there a relationship between capacity levels and mortality rates for excess deaths? And we're starting to share this with the public data, but without getting into the inflection points, we did see a strong and positive correlation between something like ICU bed count and excess mortality, uh, excess deaths two, four, and six weeks later. So we got a kind of a leading indicator that we could tell if a hospital, a region, a state was going to incur excess deaths if they were starting to reach too high of a capacity level. And then ask the really tough question that I think do no harm cares about, which is can cyber disruption uh, precipitate or accelerate or cause that harm to worsen? And of course we know fire is hot and water is wet. So of course any degraded and delayed patient care from any source can do this. But we did start asking the uncomfortable questions and looking at the state's hardest hit by that concerted effort to disrupt healthcare during the month of uh, October and November. And uh, adjusting for all other, all other variables in a state like Vermont, um, it was very clear that electronically disrupted uh, hospitals achieved that excess death red zone much faster than their peer group. So again, if minutes and hours are the difference between life and death, and you're in a geography that can't get to the next nearby facility, um, we should stop asking, can cyber attacks lead to loss of life? We've answered the question. There's enough statistical evidence now to show this. And some of these will be easier and smaller inflection points post pandemic when we can go back to fuller capacity and slack in the system. But some of the system dynamic revealed shows that if you don't have next best alternative proximal care within a certain radius, 
then that cyber disruption will cause uh, adverse events to patient care. So I was really pleased to see your testimony, Christian, uh, say very similar things, but you know, it's a somber set of recognitions, but we can at least put, move past debating if there's an impact from a lack of cyber resilience and now start talking about what the hell do we do about it? And uh, we want to make sure that we link arms with CDC and HHS and FDA and others as we go back to Congress and leaders post pandemic, because we have a lot of work to do. And many of these can't institute multi-million dollar cybersecurity measures. So what is to be done? I think part of the answer is going to come from the creativity uh, of the hacker community here. There is a lot to get back to there. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to circle back to a number of points there, but I wanted to ask Gab, you know, in the spirit of this theme of, of what have you seen or what have you learned over this period? You're, you're a cloud security expert. Have you seen different organizations, whether healthcare or non-healthcare attempt to address some of the technical debt by, by moving a lot of operations to the cloud? And then what do you sort of foresee as the implications of that with respect to the attack surface and, and how we're thinking about these problems like ransomware? another focus attacks. Yeah, so there was a huge scramble, I think, kind of near the beginning of the pandemic where a lot of companies too were wanting to move to the cloud. Um, and it's only gotten, I guess, bigger. The movement's only gotten bigger. Um, it's it's kind of accelerated that move for a lot of companies that were planning it. Um, it does increase the surface because people don't understand the cloud uh, environment completely sometimes. I think there's a lot of education to be had between, um, you know, in the relationship between the cloud provider and what their responsibility is versus what your responsibility is as the person who is putting data in the cloud. And that's where we see a lot of the breakdowns is not understanding that it's the customer responsibility to secure the data and not the cloud service provider. They're just securing the platform that the data is on. So um, things like that, I think, are going to continue to be a problem. I know we're seeing a lot more uh big breaches as far as cloud environments go lots of just even open buckets on the internet low-hanging fruit stuff like that so uh yeah i think it it's going to continue to get worse before it gets better and jessica i'm interested to hear a little bit about how you and fda at large have sort of changed your thinking a little bit because we have sort of moved from this conception of the importance of individual vulnerabilities and contained devices, which is still you know, obviously very important, but now everything living in an ecosystem, understanding some of the effects of just the degraded infrastructure and how that can adversely affect patient care. I mean, FDA is, is obviously focused on patient safety, medical devices are your purview, but how do you start thinking about things like ransomware within that context, combining it into a situation where you may have medical devices that are supported by cloud infrastructure and in sort of how that branches to be, to include the entire ecosystem and not just an individual device or an individual patient. Yeah, so I was actually going to follow up on this originally. I'd already unmuted and everything um, of Gab's point on um, on the you know sort of the, the the rush to the cloud and what that means and the different responsibilities that the different parties have. And to sort of synthesize um, the follow up I had to that and then, and then the questions you asked for FDA. There are there are medical devices, right? You can pick up something and it is a medical device. There are also medical devices that are systems, and it's you know that you may have the device that will actually deliver the care, but the calculations as to how much of a dose to give a patient, or how long for the medical device to run, or whatever else it may be, that's taking place somewhere else. That's taking place on a different computer. That's taking place in the cloud. That's taking place whatever. So for us, for the FDA, that whole thing is the medical device. The medical device is the thing. The medical device is also the entire system that is necessary to deliver the care. And we ha we saw this happen earlier this year. This was one of the first times at least that we've had it confirmed and really hit the news, where a disruption in the cloud service availability of a medical device manufacturer led to the unavailability of care for patients for an extended period of time. And the devices themselves were fine. There was nothing wrong with the devices. The devices weren't ransomware. There was no malware on the devices. They worked perfectly well. They, the calculations to figure out how much the, uh, the treatment that the patient needed happened in the cloud. So because the cloud was unavailable, the devices didn't work. And so for, for us, you know, one, this was a little bit of not a, not a new thing. Like we had always conceptualized that this could be a, a problem that we were going to have to deal with. But um, 
it, it really, it, it took a little bit of a it, perspective switch to go from, oh, we have to look at whether or not the device itself is being hacked, whatever you want to, you know, whatever hacked means, whether or not there's malware or ransomware or whatever else is on the device to maybe the, the system is just unavailable because the system is multiple parts spread over multiple locations and one of those locations is not available. And so for us and now for a lot of the medical device manufacturers that we work with, this is something that we're asking them about. We're essentially saying, what is your plan? Mostly do you have one is, is the, the implied question there. And sometimes that that's not even the answer to that is not always yes. Um, what is your plan for if the cloud or if the remote service or if the connectivity goes away? Can you still deliver care? Um, and so that's been that's been an, that's been an interesting perspective and paradigm shift or maturity or evolution, if you want to call it that. And can I add on to that? Um, so the other kind of thinking from the healthcare provider space, the the interesting impact I saw from this increased adoption of the cloud was sort of pre-pandemic. It was really common that when you went to a hospital and you had a medical device that had a cloud component, um, one of the early questions that would happen is, is there an on-prem version of this? So hospitals were really uncomfortable with systems, medical devices that had the ability or under normal use to send patient information outside of their hospital. So hospitals really wanted that on-prem solution. So manufacturers had a lot of pressure that they wanted to innovate with the cloud, but there was that demand for the on-prem solution. And so I saw a real opening up of that risk tolerance from the hospital space where now, um, you know, towards we get halfway through this pandemic, that doesn't start to be the start of the conversation. The hospitals are now just assuming that there's an off-prem component to these systems and they're doing their cyber due diligence, right? They're asking the right questions about those components, but that acceptance of a system that is not just on-prem has increased dramatically. And so um, that's been a very interesting change with that adoption is that there was kind of a forced acceptance for hospitals to update their risk tolerance for systems that weren't just on-prem. Those are all great insights. And I will say just uh, being adjacent to this space, I would confirm all of that. And also that the conversations evolving, not just to let's not have an on-prem solution, we're okay with a cloud solution or a remote solution, but that that could potentially be an answer for some of their internal cybersecurity concerns. Meaning as Jeff, or as uh, Josh mentioned, you know, a, the task force reported that nearly 85% of hospitals in estimation lacked a full-time security professional. And so this is not a problem that is being solved very quickly. And so they're left with this question. It's almost like a selling point for some manufacturers to say, well, we have a cloud solution in which we can secure this data better than you could potentially do at your own institution. Therefore, it's almost being seen as like a security upsell. And I will say that this is also very commonly cited as a reason to go to cloud hosting for the electronic health record. You know, as we talk about the ecosystem of healthcare, there's so much technology required to take care of patients. One of the most important elements of that's of medical devices, but another really important part of that is the electronic health record. And I jokingly call it the operating system of healthcare. You can't do anything in a hospital without the electronic health record. You can't admit a patient. You can't order drugs or treatments or uh, test results. You can't even review that notes without the electronic health record. And as we see now a push to really host all of that content uh, in cloud services, uh, usually by medical, by electronic health record vendors. And it is part of their selling process to say this is more secure. In fact, they cite it as a reason for why you should invest in it, because if your hospital is ransomed, then you can still access your electronic health records through some web portal. And no one's ever talking about uh, that consolidation of services into one focal point that if attacked and ransom, for example, would lead to the failure of an electronic health record, not for one hospital or five hospitals, but for hundreds or potentially thousands of institutions across the country at once. And that's not anything anyone's talking about. So thank you all for bringing that to light. Um, my well, next can I question- also, Christian, can I, can I just really quickly, there's another thing that really gets me about this. And I think that we saw this with some of the ransomware attacks on hospitals today, like to the point of like, oh, like just put your electronic health record in the cloud. Then if you get ransomware, you can still access it. What you, on what computer? On what device am I, am I gonna pull up my personal phone and be like, hold on, I, I need to pull up your personal medical record. What's, are you okay? It's fine, it's fine. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, all the endpoints are owned, they're all ransomed. And it's funny because one of the common backup uh, strategies employed by hospitals is actually to have 
what they call a cold storage workstation. So at a lot of hospitals that are well resourced, these are not uh, a lot of hospitals still don't even have this. They plan for a downtime of their electronic health record, like a fiber line gets cut or they lose uh, access to their data center or whatever it's going to be. There are computers that are supposed to be in most areas that are uh, a day late in their medical records, meaning that they are hosted somewhat locally. They still have connectivity, but they are thought to be you'll have at least last uh, yesterday's electronic health record data. And that's what people are citing as a potential mitigation to lack of availability, availability of medical records. And I just think to myself, those are the same endpoints that get owned and ransomed. Uh, you, your backup solution doesn't anticipate that. So what I'm trying to get at here is that a lot of hospitals, healthcare delivery organizations, prepare for technical downtime in the context of uh, the power goes out, a fiber line gets cut, a, a patch goes awry and they're down for three, five, eight hours, 24 hours at the most. And guess what? You can use all these other systems. They do not plan for technical failure uh, of a catastrophic nature, such as ransomware, wherein there are no endpoints you can trust, or they all might be ransom that your current technical backups simply will not work. So great insight, everyone. And I really appreciate all that. Anything else before we move on to the next question on this? So one of the things we had talked about, you know, there's a lot that happened uh, during the pandemic. And one of the things that I, I'm so happy, you know, I'm, a, I'm an ER doc. So one of the things that really like, brought tears to my eyes thinking about was just how quickly we got vaccines out, right? That amazing feat, which was the science, the development of the vaccine, the research, the data collection, the statistics, and then the subsequent production of it is a, a miracle, you know, an honest, uh, amazing thing that happened. We, d we had heard of attacks on the vaccine pipeline development. You know, is it, to my knowledge, none of that impacted the time at which we got the vaccine, but we can imagine in the future, you know, how many other vulnerable parts of healthcare we have. We have hospitals, the medical devices, but we have the whole medical research world. We have the vaccine development world. Can every, everyone kind of reflect a little bit about how the pipeline in which we bring new drugs out, new vaccines itself is very vulnerable to these types of things. And we should be talking more about it. And what do we do about it? Because clearly uh, there was already a failure during one of our humanity's, you know, arguably most important points. Um, maybe I'll start the answer and others can fill it in. Um, without getting into, you know, sensitive names, many of you heard at least about Operation Warp Speed, where we gave money to accelerate the development and distribution of vaccines for the first time in our species on coronaviruses, we weren't even sure it would work. So we had backup plans for therapeutics and diagnostics. Um, but it, there were various stages of that relay race with different accidents and adversaries with different manifestations of harm. And it was pretty uh, precarious. And it's not as obvious as just do world-class cybersecurity. So the stages we looked at were the first stage was really R&D and clinical trials. Then it was fill and finish and scaled production, uh, scaled production and fill and finish. Then it was cold chain, cold storage distribution all the way through administration. In the first stage, it was a lot of espionage, you know, like, can we find out who's working on what and steal their recipes or intellectual property? In the second stage, you started to see more financially motivated criminals that wanted to profit off disruption or ransoms or DDoS or other forms of extortion. And in the last stage, uh, Murphy was really the, the top at, uh, adversary of just logistical confusion and uh, working it between the federal level and the state level. Uh, but yeah, we uh, in record time created uh, effective vaccines and made enough of them for most people to get it. The, the weak link in the whole chain without changing topics is that while we uh, we beat uh, biology faster than bureaucracy, it was really tough to figure out who owns you know combating mystics and malinformation. And information operations that sowed a lot of um, vaccine hesitancy across a number of categories and a number of demographics. So while we were racing to develop cures to, to achieve herd immunity and protect the American interest and the global interest, um, the weak link in the chain seemed to be um, fighting misperceptions or misinformation sufficiently to get uh, enough of this adoption. So well, we're not yet done the pandemic work, but I think each of those revealed that once you got past the really big R&D, the real challenge is that target rich cyber poor, because some of these very rare manufacturers had three IT people, zero security people, no security budget. You could sneeze on them and they, and it would probably lead to the death of a lot of people. 
So we had a really harrowing job of identifying, engaging, informing, trying to protect them while there was a lot of people throwing Molotov cocktails around. So a um, lot of a successful attacks, but hopefully not successful delay to what you've now seen produced. But uh, it shatters your assumptions that people are doing good cybersecurity. A lot of these players are brand new and haven't yet matured to the point where they can be resilient against even a script kitty. I agree that uh, misinformation is basically one of the worst weak points, but I did spend the majority of the pandemic kind of on the other side of uh, the vaccine table. I was involved in uh, one of the vaccine manufacturers uh, studies in a genetic consultant capacity. So um, my main concern as the study kind of progressed was the amount of information that was going to so many places and we didn't know what that place's security looked like. So, um, I mean, the study I worked on had thousands of research sites that we were trying to recruit people at and each one of those research sites has their own security and we've got like the entire you know, information about the vaccine going to these sites, hundreds of pages of information about the structure and the function and things like that. And um, it made me really nervous because you don't know what their security looks like. You don't know if they're, you know, printing it out and like tossing them in the street or, uh, you know, leaving USB drives with that stuff on it everywhere. Um, and I think the information control is another one of our weak links that we might need to start to address um, in the future. Yes, I mean, it's interesting. I take both of those points really well as a sort of, you know, the, the wild variation in capability between everyone all along the supply chain, but I almost go the opposite direction. My concern is that everyone is the same in that everybody is using the same hardware and everybody is using the same operating systems and everybody is using the same software. It, because what we're seeing or what we've experienced is when we get, um, vulnerabilities that pop up in Windows or in, you know, whatever it is, shared shared operating system, shared applications, you know, you've got SolarWinds, you've got Kaseya, you've got this, that, and the other thing. We, we're all seeing, you know, the, how interconnected everybody is and relying on the same software and hardware. Um, everybody within the supply chain is immediately hit. You know, the medical device manufacturers, the, the, the pharma companies, the HDOs, the federal government, we're all suddenly experiencing the same problem at the same time. Um, and that obviously creates, you know, a, a huge problem of, um, are we all prepared to respond to it? You know, if we're not prepared to respond to it, what do we do? Uh, and, you know, it's, I don't think it's a secret that there's wild variation even in the federal government uh, in, in terms of one, the agencies themselves being able to secure themselves, um, but different sectors uh, being more or less involved in the cybersecurity of their sectors. And so obviously here I am, FDA has been very forward leaning um, in medical device cybersecurity for a long time. Uh, but you know, some, of the, some other sectors are um, really just starting to begin their, their cybersecurity journey of working with their sectors um, in, in trying to recognize that everything is digital. All manufacturing lines are digital. Nobody's hand making much of anything, you know, anymore these days that you've got robots making everything. So, you, you know, if, if something goes down on the manufacturing line, the product is affected, the manufacturing line is affected, the supply chain downstream is affected. And so, you know, the intricate and really delicate nature of all of our, uh, supply chains from a cybersecurity perspective, I think is really, um, fascinating uh, and also very frightening. Oh my goodness, that perfectly segues into our next question, which I'll, I'll first to start with Stephanie, and then we'll, we'll love to get everyone's opinion on this because it seems to be, to me, a very uncontroversial topic, but has become increasingly controversial. And I don't understand why. Um, the concept of software bill of materials, you know, this thought that uh, to combat these types of supply chain concerns, we need increasing transparency about what constitutes uh, the software and hardware that we use insofar as uh, being able to identify when a vulnerability is found, what, what devices and what software imp uh, will be vulnerable to that. So there's this been, you know, this concept of software bill of materials, a, a nutrition label, if you will, for what components are within a particular device or a, a software suite itself, clearly <clears throat> seems to be compelling argument in medical devices for, for exactly what you've mentioned. Can everyone here quickly just 
reflect upon why, you know, what about software bill materials? How will that address these concerns if it will? And how do we operationalize that? Because that seems to be a big focal point of some of the criticism. Uh, perhaps start with Stephanie. Yeah, and so it's an interesting one to bring up because it's, like you said, it's a very polarizing topic when you talk to people. Um, and I'm in the camp that the software bill materials is actually a really good thing. And, uh, but playing the devil's advocate, when I do hear people kind of take a more, um, a harder stand against bill, software bill materials, you know, they're always citing things like, is that not just, you know, giving a a blueprint basically to my device to the bad guys. Um, I'm of the mindset that no, the bad guys can figure that stuff out anyway, but that is one of the common uh, criticisms I hear about it. It's been interesting watching the last couple months of, I think a, a big sort of force multiplier in the space is the most recent executive order, I think it was May 15th, um, that really just accelerated this idea of software build materials. And so I've seen a big shift from the thinking of, should we do it, should we not do it, and more to, okay, how do we do it? it it on the surface sounds like a really simple thing, but actually when you get down into how do you make one, how do you have a, how do you do it consistently? How does everyone speak the same language? But then more importantly, how do you actually use it to your point, Christian? How do you operationalize and get value from it? There are so many TBDs um, in that life cycle that it becomes it becomes a really interesting conversation. But I think that most recent executive order has actually um, I think taking some of those naysayers and said, okay, well, you can still be a naysayer, but this is happening. <laughs> um, and so that's been good. The other piece I see as a kind of resistance to the idea of it, and again, the executive order kind of dwarfs all of this, but um, this idea that it's it's almost fixating on the wrong piece of the puzzle. Um, in a lot of regards, the, the reason you want finished product uh, software build materials is so that if you are a user or a consumer of that device and there's a new vulnerability in some commodity operating system to Jessica's point, you don't have to wait to hear from the manufacturer. You can kind of do your own due diligence and threat management to say, oh, wait, I have 10 things that are affected by that. Um, but so the criticism I've heard is that the, the bigger underlying issue is that you there's a struggle right now to basically rely on the manufacturer to give you timely communications and that if the manufacturer was actually giving you timely communications, you shouldn't be the one having to do that level of threat management. You shouldn't need the software bill of materials because you should be able to rely on getting um, timely and accurate information from the manufacturer. So I, I sort of agree with what but those criticisms are pointing at that maybe the answer is more of how do we make that timeline more succinct, but I think the software bill of materials is a good place to start as kind of a common stakeholder um, and let's try to solve this together and yes, it would be great to get to the point where you don't have to manage software bills of materials because manufacturers are actively telling you um, the risk, but we're not there yet. <laughs> Well, I think the, the other thing is, and, and so the, I'm going to reveal my absolute adoration for Epsilon here very quickly, but um, for a lot of the, the users that I work with on a daily basis, it's with the healthcare delivery organizations themselves, so the, the actual hospitals, the chief information security officers, the chief information officers at these places. They want this information. Um, the manufacturers have actually tried to be like, no, 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 don't worry, we'll just do it for you, rely on us, it's going to be fine, and they're like, no you will give us this information because he, well, and so let me, let me back up. So I love software real materials. I think it's fantastic. Um, I actually am glad I got to speak before Josh because I think otherwise he would have stolen my line, which is that you can't protect what you don't know you have. Um, and this, that's the whole thing about what software real materials is, is about. If I don't know what I'm running because software is not, you know, nobody is, you know, going up to this, un, you know, this big chunk of, of, marble software and like chiseling out a new program. That's not how you make software these days. You build software out of other little pieces of software. And if you don't know what the other little pieces of software are, then when there's a problem with it, you have no idea what's going on. You're like, well, the device is freaking out. Don't know why. It could be one of the 50 components that this thing is made out of. Um, so software building materials helps you address that problem. Is it a perfect solution? No. Is it a start? Yes. And um, the, the interesting thing for us, so look, the FDA is going to require, eh, it's in guidance. Guidance isn't voluntary. I can see, somebody's laughing because this is like, a, we won't go here, but guidance is voluntary, but it's guidance and it's in guidance. Um, that medical device manufacturers have to have, it's a cybersecurity bill of materials now, but it's the same thing as software bill of materials. Um, 
But for us in the executive, you know, we're going to require it. The executive order said thou shalt do it for certain situations. But for us, it's, that's not even what it's about anymore. It's getting into contract language. Where medical, hospital delivery organizations are essentially going to medical device manufacturers and saying, we're putting that you must give us software bill materials in our contract. Therefore, if you don't, one, we're not going to buy your product. And two, if you don't do it, it's breach of contract. So like, forget what the government says. Your customers are now like, yeah, we're, you, you got to fork it over. So for me, it's, you know, it's, it's been kind of fun and a little bit funny um, to watch a lot of the debate that's going on with software bill materials to Stephanie's point about like, oh, like, should we do this or should we not do this? I'm like, well, I really don't think that's the question anymore. Like either because your contract says you must or because a bunch of federal agencies say you must, like you're going to have to do this. So my recommendation to the extent that anybody is asking me, seize your own destiny become very good at software bill materials very fast because you're going to have to do it one way or the other. I mean, I, we don't, we could have easily have an entire panel on SBOM, so I won't repeat most of those, but you know, some of these common, there, there are a bunch of common, sometimes often good faith concerns about it. Many of them have fantastic answers at nta.gov slash SBOM. There's an FAQ, there's a, you know, myth busting type set of resources. And some of them are, you know, genuine concerns like, won't this be a, you know, roadmap to the attacker? And we have a phenomenal answer about why it's more often a roadmap to the defender. And, you know, people keep saying that hospitals could never use this and it's going to, it's going to be work they can't afford. And they're on camera and on record begging for it. So I, I think we should, for people who hate FUD, we should stop purveying it. Um, if you have questions, there's usually great answers to them and they're usually documented. And then to the executive order, maybe to pivot to the end of this part. Um, you know, what do we care about as hacker community? What are our values? Because I love that the executive order started with a value statement. My favorite sentence is, in the end, the trust we place in our digital infrastructure should be proportional to how trustworthy and transparent that infrastructure is and to the consequences we will incur if that trust is misplaced. So this doesn't say that ingredients lists on food stops health problems or junk food it doesn't stop anything but it's part of a regime of transparency and trustworthiness and for those who say software bill of materials isn't proven yet until we have 10 years of study this is a practice stolen from deming in the 40s for automotive then went into every manufacturing now it's in chemicals and food bombs are proven it's about time we embrace them so software bomb isn't going to be identical the growing pains are really going to come from it. We have a lot of technical debt and people are afraid to reveal their technical debt. But as we start identifying and paying down some of that technical debt, we're going to wonder why we never had these before. That's, these are all fantastic things. I'll also just say, you know, one of the biggest concerns we have now, common talking points around uh, healthcare cybersecurity is this concern for legacy devices. And how looking back, we don't know what, we, what vulnerabilities exist. We don't even have a, a good um, understanding or visibility in that. Well, guess what? Today's cutting edge medical devices are the legacy devices in five years, right? And so getting ahead or five or 10, I saw, saw Josh look up towards there. You're right. At some point, the current generation medical devices will become legacy devices and knowing what's under their hood will help us in the future. We have to start that now. I wish we had started it you know, 20 years ago, and a lot of the concerns around legacy medical devices and what's vulnerable, what isn't, and what we need to worry about that lead to some of the most harrowing stories about cybersecurity vulnerabilities and medical devices would have been alleviated to some degree by software bill materials if we had done it sooner. So, you know, really an important thing for us to get started sooner rather than later, because the uh, return on investment only gets better as these devices age. And so, great. Um, uh, anything else on software build materials before Jeff takes us to our next question? Yeah, and I think we're actually running up against the hour here. So this will probably be the final question. Um, I think just, just by the nature of how complex this entire topic is, we can, we can kind of easily trend towards some of the more inside baseball aspects of this. So I think it's really important that we've hit on things like SBOM, but I do kind of want to bring it back as we close to this idea, Christian, that you and I um, and the others who started this kind of brought to the table, which was we want somewhere that uh, the average DEF CON attendee can come and learn about healthcare security, how they can get involved. And so I kind of want to say, we do a lot of admiring the problem. Um, things like SBOMs are definitely steps in the right direction towards solutions. But for the average person with no real background in this, I kind of want to understand how the panel thinks 
um, that they may be able to help out because we, we actually do need everybody and anybody who's willing to contribute to some of these issues. And so I want to break this into kind of two, two groups of people to ask the question. And first, I want to start with Gab, who has you know, one of the most interesting career arcs with respect to all of the spaces she's been in and how her journey has taken her and ended up at this point, what her advice would be to somebody who's maybe insecurity, maybe like hacking, how they can kind of combine interests and the desire to help with healthcare, and then sort of move through Stephanie, but then end up with, with Joss and Jessica, you know, not everybody is going to be able to testify before Congress on some of these issues. Not everybody is going to be at some of these high level discussions, but how can the average hacker get involved in the policy mechanisms? How can they contribute to some of these initiatives? And what your advice would be. So long question there, but let's start with Gab. Say like somebody shows up at Juno Harm in person in Vegas and says, hey, this is awesome. How can I get involved? You know, what's your advice for me? Yeah, so I, I was thinking back to because it was only a couple years ago that I actually made the career switch and um, just trying to think, like, what would I tell my former self to do? And a lot of it was just, I guess, be a little bit more proactive as to the research I was doing. Um, and trying to understand the entire the big picture it's not just the software of the device or the hardware of the device um it also plays into how it's used that threat landscape um and even the policy side of things the just knowing you know what parameters it has to adhere to what um what specifications it's supposed to meet things like that i think were really helpful in kind of understanding that entire big picture of um medical device research and just getting your hands on as much information as possible. Awesome. And so I'd follow that with, um, you know, if you're in the security space and you're looking at the medical device space and thinking to yourself, like, I would just love to make an impact here, right? Um, so there's I think one of the, the biggest ways for security people in the space to make an impact, I mean, it, you know, one, you know, help medical device manufacturers, you know, work for them, they all have open job recs. But if you're, if you're trying to just say, you know, how can I, how can I come in and make an impact in this space? I think one of the really underserved areas I always see is standards and regulatory working groups. And I'll be the first to say, it's not sexy. It's a boring, a lot. Um, it's, it's super boring. I've sat through hours listening to arguments about where commas should be placed. Um, but at the end of the day, those standards and those regulations that are coming out are guiding the future of the, the industry. And they absolutely need subject matter experts in security to sit and, and sit through those arguments about where commas should be so that at the end of the day, the technology recommendations, the technology requirements inside of those guidance documents are actually ones that align with the unique needs of the medical device space and actually meet industry and security best practices. So it is not sexy. I will tell you it is boring. But if you are sitting there thinking, I have a lot of security knowledge and I want to make a big impact in the healthcare space absolutely join working groups, absolutely join standards and regulatory groups that are trying to push the industry forward. That is a huge area that you can have an impact. Rochambeau, you? <laughs> um, I would say um, great answers. Um, I, I do think the, the, the quote she was uh, trying to prompt me with earlier uh, is that I often say to policymakers, through our overdependence on undependable things, we've created the conditions such that the actions of any accident or adversary can have a profound impact on public safety, national security, something along those lines. So it's really about the relationship between how dependent we are and how dependable those things are. So um, pivoting off that great recommendation that a ton of these medical device makers are hiring, um, some of these hackers aren't reporting to them, they're working for them, large and growing teams. There are 10,000 medical device makers creating the next wave of medical breakthroughs, and only about 100 of them are large. The rest of them are tiny. So they really do need help and advice and scalable ways to do threat modeling or build less brittle devices. The hospitals need a ton of help too, and they just don't have the resources. So I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm getting really disgusted with this notion of they should just do zero trust or they should just do MFA and they should just do best practices. They, they just can't do just those things. So at least uh, one of the ways I'd like to embrace the talent pool here at DEF CON is um, I pushed really hard for a few new things and the life software and support and service of national critical functions is dangerous. Uh, and that it's especially dangerous when it's exposed to the internet. Uh, the use of hard-coded default maintenance passwords exposed on the internet. Uh, this will be happy to hear this, but we have a document coming out to get your stuff off search. So 
if you're exposed on something like Shodan or Census IO or uh, the other tools to find connected devices, you know, we want to start becoming more practical and pragmatic so that without huge budgets right now, we can at least remove some of the most egregious elective attack surface. Uh, and our brand new director, Director East Release, are things we do, but we have to meet people where they are. on board. Um, I don't know that healthcare. Um, but, you know, I don't think I've said this yet. Before I worked at FDA, I worked for the, the Congress. I worked for the Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, and I was the tech English dictionary. I was like the walking tech English dictionary when people were like, we don't know what these words mean. We don't know what this concept is. Can you explain this? And that was my job. Um, and Congress needs that a lot. So for those of you who are like, hmm, maybe it would be interesting to get involved in the federal government. One, FDA always needs people. We, you know, if, if you like the idea of pulling apart medical devices and uh, getting to determine whether or not they're secure and stuff, come be a reviewer. Come apply to be a reviewer at FDA and get to determine whether or not a medical device gets to go onto the market because it has good or bad cybersecurity. Um, but you can also go to Congress. There's something called Tech Congress, um, techcongress.io. Uh, they bring in somewhere, I think, between like 10 and 20 fellows every year and place them in congressional offices. You become that office's technical expert. Uh, and people have gone on to like do great things uh, from the Tech Congress Fellowship. And they've, you know, they, a lot of them have stayed in Congress. They've done, um, you know, they, they've done just a lot of just amazing work. And so um, if you think policy is something that you want to do, you pick your agency. Pick your agency and go. Pick pick your branch of government and go. We we need all the help that we can get. So you know, throw in. We're we're ready to we're ready. Well, thank you again to all of our panelists for joining. I wish we had three or four hours to talk about all this stuff. At which point, I'm sure all of you guys would hate me uh, if we kept you here for this long. Um, this is just one of many conversations we've had. If you're interested more in this, there are all of our prior do no harm panels that have been recorded are available on the DEF CON YouTube channel. And then for those of you who are going to be in person at DEF CON, vaccinated and masked, we'll be having a live in person, uh, do no harm, uh, this DEF CON as well. Uh, and with that, we want to say thank you to all of our panelists. Jeff and I are going to clap for you guys. Come on, you got this. Thank you so much. You, we love you all and you all are brilliant. We learn from all of you every time we speak with you. Uh, stay safe, stay distanced, Stay masked and get vaccinated if you can. And with that, do no harms, another one in the bag. Thank you, everybody. Take care. One last Thank final you. shout out. We we can't end this without um, giving mad props to the biohacking village. And it's a little bit anachronistic because I think it'll be over by the time that you're listening to this video. But anybody else who wants any other resources or inspiration or just an incredible experience, add that to your future DEF CON plans because they're incredible. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Stay safe. <laughs>